Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Does this book still need an introduction? Of course it does. Every book needs an introduction, even if we've said the introduction, what is it, 65 times? Not, not that long, it's more like 20. Yeah, maybe 23. So, we once again return to my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories are... Drum roll, please. Well, I flipped to the correct page. Oliver Octopus Takes a Job by Margaret Connor and The Deer Forest by Rosemary Bromley. Oh, dear. But first, Oliver. Oliver Octopus Takes a Job. Oliver Octopus was an adventurous young octopus. He swam further from home than any of his brothers. He wanted to go and see what life was like ashore. So he let the tide take him, and he floated lazily on a big wave, which swooshed him onto the beach. This is fun, said Oliver. He climbed up the beach. The first thing he saw was a beach cafe. Lots of people were waiting to be served at the tables under the big umbrellas outside. They were getting very impatient, as there did not seem to be a waiter anywhere. Suddenly, a man came hurrying out of the cafe. He was Mr. Chips, the manager. Oh dear, he was saying to himself, what am I going to do? All these people are waiting for lunch and my waiter has not turned up yet. Can I help you? asked Oliver. Well, said Mr. Chips, who was very surprised to see an octopus. I have never had an octopus working for me before, but you have lots of arms. I could do with an extra pair of hands. I have eight arms, said Oliver proudly. I'm walking on two of them, so that leaves six for carrying things. How splendid, said Mr. Chips. Come to the kitchen and I'll show you what to do. The chef showed Oliver a sideboard full of plates of food waiting to be carried to the people outside. Do you think you could carry a few of these? asked Mr. Chips. Mr. Chips put a clean white folded table napkin on each of Oliver's six arms, and Oliver picked up three plates on each arm, one in his hand and two balanced, like a real waiter all the way up his arm. And if you can do arithmetic, you will know that that means he carried six times three lots of plates all at once. Eighteen plates! Oliver was the best waiter Mr. Chips had ever seen in his life, and 18 people were all served at once. It didn't take Oliver long to finish that job. So when all the hungry people were happy and eating their lunch, Oliver had another idea. He stood outside the cafe and started juggling with six plates at the same time. He was so clever that he never dropped a single plate. And the people were so pleased that they clapped their hands and threw coins at his feet. Oliver enjoyed his adventure, but he knew that if he wanted to go back to his family that night, he would have to hurry before the last tide went out. So he collected the coins and put them into a box for poor children who could not have a holiday at the seaside. Then he waved goodbye to everyone and went back to the beach. A big wave swooshed onto the beach and swept Oliver back to the bottom of the sea to his brothers. That was a lovely adventure, wasn't it? I love how the manager was surprised at an octopus, not surprised at the fact that an octopus could talk. It's like, the first thing in my head was like, man, this octopus is talking to me. Okay. No, no, he's just like, oh, wow, I didn't expect to see an octopus here. Dude, the octopus is talking to you. Octopus don't have lips. Well, for all we know in this universe, talking octopi are common. Apparently. Also, the art is very fantastic. It's like this really nice cartoon style. Also, I think the octopus changes sizes. Because here he's as tall as this guy sitting, and he's taller than the table, which would put him much taller than this image where he's standing next to the manager. One, we don't know how tall the manager is, and two, if you look, this table with the patron is further back. 
it looks like it may be slightly in the background, but I don't think it's enough to really change the scale enough on the octopus there. Probably not, but you had to have a lot of room to show 18 plates. I'm not quite sure an octopus could actually stand up on two arms like that. No, but supposedly they're quite clever. Oh, yeah. Octopus and things in that family of creature are insanely smart. I, I mean, some scientists say that if we disappeared, they'd take over. Yes, I understand that they are escape artists and are considered on par with young children under the age of five. Hmm. So, but all the images are nice. What's really interesting is he kind of gets darker throughout the images. He starts out as this kind of bright yellow, then he gets a little bit more brown here, and then he's kind of a brown color with a little bit of salmon pink underneath his belly in the last image. Um, maybe it has to do with how long he's been out of the water. Hmm. I quite enjoyed this story. It's just that whole, like, the thing he's surprised about. Look, I didn't expect to see an octopus here. Yeah, so I also find it interesting. You know, early on, you used to interrupt me more. We're, we're going to run into issues with our fair use terms. Oh, because we talk about it afterwards, we're okay, especially with these short stories. It's the longer stories that I have a tendency to interrupt you because it works better that way. It's just these stories are like two pages long. So should I move on to the poem that I've just noticed on this page? Sure. The Tea Clipper. Blow, wind, blow, over the tropical sea. Blow the fine old sailing boat, home to you and me. All the way from India, loaded up with tea. Tea is capitalized at the end. All three letters. I have no idea why. Hmm. Nice little shot of a ship sailing away from an island, or past it. I'm not quite sure. Well, the island doesn't look like India, so... Probably past it. It looks like one of those standard deserted islands that you find deserted sailors on. Or Captain Sparrow in his rum. But it doesn't look like anybody's home. I just see palm trees. And a little bit of grass. Alright, so let's move on to the deer forest. Oh dear. The deer forest. The autumn air was crisp and the sun shone through the pine trees as the group of red deer trotted down the forest path. Melissa, their leader, turned her head to see if her calf was close behind her. Hurry up, Sasha, she called. I smelt danger on the mountainside. We must all go home at once. Sasha ran nearer his mother. I didn't see anything, he said. I heard sounds and saw movements I don't understand. That means danger, replied Melissa. Sasha said no more. He was very proud of his mother. Every deer in the herd knew that Melissa was their leader. Deep in the forest, Melissa felt safer. As she led the deer towards home, she listened to the blackbirds singing, saw rabbits dart away, and squirrels playing high in the pine trees. Her sharp eyes even caught a glimpse of a fox slinking by. Are we nearly home? asked Sasha. I'm tired and hungry. We are nearly there, little one, said his mother. Look, here is the clearing with the woodman's cottage, and there are some bushes near his back door which we like to nibble. Well, there is no time to nibble them now, and you must never come here alone. I don't think the woodman means us any harm, but it is safer not to go too near humans. At last they were on their home ground. The hinds, as Mother Red Deer are called, gathered around Melissa. Sasha and his eldest brother trotted off to play. Mother says that father will soon be home again, said Sasha. Yes, said his brother. All the stags will be on their way home now from their summer grazing places. When we are old enough, will we go with him when he goes away? I expect so. Come on, let's have a race. For a moment, Sasha felt sad at the thought of ever leaving his mother, but he soon forgot it in the excitement of the game. That night, the moon shone so brightly it was almost like day. Melissa stirred, opened her eyes, and looked to see if Sasha was asleep. He was nowhere to be seen. Filled with alarm, she stood very still, listening for any sound that would tell her that her calf was nearby. But she heard nothing but the wind in the pine trees. Then she remembered something that she had said earlier that day. Quickly, she trotted down the deer path towards the woodman's cottage. The moonlight shone brilliantly as Melissa reached the clearing. She waited for a moment before venturing forward. Then she saw Sasha. He was by the woodman's back door, having a fine meal from his favorite bush. I'm sure he's the naughtiest calf in the herd, she grumbled to herself. Sasha looked up and saw his mother standing in the shelter of the trees. 
Oh dear, he thought. I shall get into trouble now, but I was so hungry. He had trotted halfway towards his mother when a loud roar echoed through the forest and a large, handsome stag with fine antlers leapt across the clearing. In her excitement at seeing Sasha's father again, Melissa quite forgot to scold her disobedient son. Okay, I'm kind of confused by this story. It just seems to go on. Like, there's no real point to it. It's just someone talking about deer going through a forest because there's danger, and then father's back. Basically, the deer go home, the fawn sneaks off where his mother said don't go alone, the mother finds him, and then the father shows up. Just kind of aimless. Like, it, what, what was the point of this one? Art's kind of cute, though. The mother looks kind of funky right there, though. The face just looks kind of very derp. Not even a cross, I just kind of derp. But the picture of the three of them on the second page looks pretty good. Yeah, that's very lovely. Also, Sasha looks very good in that shot there. Uh, on the first page. They all look nice in that final shot there. Oh, and it looks like we have another poem. We usually don't have two in a row. We've had two in a row before, but it's been a while. Mm-hmm. I'm Desperate Dan, the cowboy man. I'm Dangerous Dan McGrew. I ride across the prairie when I've nothing else to do. I chase the bad man in the west, in my cart for all to see. And when I've rescued all my friends, I go home to tea. That was really cute. <laughs> Almost to the point that I was laughing. Especially with the pictures. Because it looks like two kids playing out a story. There's a picture at the top of a wagon. I'm guessing it's probably the standard red wagon. Not the company red wagon, but it's a wood box. So it was probably red or brown. And the bottom one is like these chibi versions of these characters. Because they just have eyes and mouths and they're very rounded. But see, at the top it's empty. And at the bottom he has someone in the wagon. And since they're both smiling, that should be one of the rescued friends, not one of the bad man. Just very cute. That, that was kind of more fun than the story. Yeah. The story, just the thing about that one, just... Just kind of meandered. It's like, I'm going to tell you this. Okay. I, I'm going to fit in a couple things, like that the leader of the deer is a woman. The stags don't always hang out with the female deer. And that the female mother deer are called hinds. It threw me that they were calling the fawns calves. I've always heard fawn. Well, those were two nice stories. I liked the poem on this page more than the story it was on. Just, it was so fun and cute. Even though it starts out with that, I'm this. And the tone of voice you were using was great. Yeah, because I kind of skimmed. <laughs> we were waiting for some background noises to clear up. Yep. And you're not going to hear any of them because I edit them out. Well, maybe. Mostly. I do what I can. <laughs> so even though both of these had animals, they aren't ones that are on my mental list of stories I read a lot in this book. It seems like the last 20 pages or so are mostly ones I don't recall. Which makes sense because I know me, I would have started on page one every time. <laughs> And then only when I was older would I have actually skipped through to specific stories. Hmm. And also out of the two stories, I definitely like the octopus one more. Well, it kind of had more of a beginning, middle, and end. We had a character. He wanted to do a thing. He did a thing. And he went home. Uh, Julie, do the thing! <laughs> uh, Legend of Korra reference, check. Yep. All right, so this has been another installment of My Bedtime Book of Two-Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were Oliver Octopus Takes a Job by Margaret Connor and The Deer Forest by Rosemary Bromley. Thank you for listening. I mean, if you're still here, I hope you enjoyed it. There are other stories from the two-minute book of stories and there are other stories in general and there's lots of other content you know pop culture stuff video games tv series web series netflix series we spend the gambit all available on the channel so we have lots of ways that you can use your time 
please check out other videos. Like, subscribe, share, watch videos, leave comments. We do read them. And often answer them. M mostly her. I try, but I'm a terrible typist. And, you know, doing it on the phone, I got voice dictation and everything. But I'm never gonna... And then he has to go back and correct it. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this book and haven't picked up a copy yet, it's still floating around on Amazon for about the same price that apparently I got it at a yard sale at some point. And if you just feel like shopping, there's also an Ebates link. Oh, did I forget to mention when I mentioned this book being available on Amazon, we, we put a link there for you? That's kind of a thing. And now for the standard disclaimer, Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thank you again for listening.